All right, welcome back. This is another episode of Tuned In with Jim Cummings. Of course, I'm joined by Jim. How are you doing today? It's another day in paradise. And look who's here. Today we have John Reese davies Thank you so much for joining us. You know him from Lord of the Rings as Gimli. You know him from Indiana Jones. Legendary actor. Raiders. Oh my gosh. What a talent. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. You. A legend in his own mind, definitely. Yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> All right, who's, well, got, the, who's no. got the tricky questions? All right, I, I don't know, but, you know, one of my favorite pictures, I should probably dig it up here, is um, uh, a month or so ago, we met at a con, and mm -hmm. it was a beautiful thing, and my wife, his mom, a very beautiful girl, and, and it, you, you happened upon her in the hallway, and, yep. and you were a gentleman, and, and it was... It was a beautiful thing, and wow, a, it was yeah. a lovely moment, a truly yeah. lovely well, moment. Well, you know, we should have fun at these things. Oh, my goodness. It, it should be a... That's, our whole lives that's why should we're be here. joyful and, and, yes. and playful and fun. Yes. Um, Amen. Because the world is a somewhat dark and, and grim place, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, nowadays, now more so than in recent history. Now more I, so, I think... I think I think we're living in a time that's more dangerous than Cuba Week. Mm. And I remember Cuba Week because... Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the Bay of Pigs? Bay of Pigs? Yes, that's right. So that's right, yeah. Yeah, what is Cuba Week? I'm, I'm not familiar. Oh, well, well... Kennedy was president. Kennedy was president. Yeah. Uh, the Russians were going to put missiles... Oh, on, this is like the missile crisis? Cuba. Yeah, Cuban oh, okay, missile okay. crisis. Yes, uh, that's right. And um, it was... A damn close run thing. You know, the Americans were going to stop the Russian mm -hmm. ships one way or the other. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the Russians said, if you stop our ships, it is an act of war. Yeah. And uh, we were all sweating a bit. It's a very nasty and dangerous world. And that's why we come to Comic Cons <laughs> to get the hell away from that crap. Right? I mean, <laughs> to get a little respite, get a little, little. Uh, cleansing breath. I had had two remarkable conversations here um, in this Comic Con. Yes. The first was with a young computer programmer. Mm. And I said, so what sort of computers are you using? Are you, are you into artificial intelligence yet? He said, yes, yeah, getting that way, getting that way. And I said, tell me, is there a real threat from artificial intelligence? And he said, well... That's a yes. Uh, <laughs> no. Oh, okay. Good. That was a good not answer. Not yet. Uh, and I said, not yet. Uh, well, when will we know that there is a threat? And he paused and he said, not until it's too late. Mm. That was a, an interesting moment. Hmm. The other guy, I said, well, what do you do? And he said, I'm a financial analyst. I look at the figures for the economy and things like that. And I said, what are the figures telling you? And he said, we're in deep trouble. Mm. Mm. Perfect. Just wanted to cheer Yeah, you yeah. Up. <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs> John Reese Davies. <laughs> I just want to thank you all for, <laughs> for your short, brief lives that are clearly going to come to a... A rather short ending soon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, uh, on a lighter note, this is tuned in with Jim Cummings. I was looking through your credits, and you've done an extensive amount of voice work oh, as my. well. And in 1996, you did Boo to You 2, Winnie the Pooh, as the narrator. Do you remember that? Nope. No? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you do so many of these things, and over 50 yeah. or 60 years, uh, they, you know, you that particular day that you spent three hours in a recording studio. Yeah, yeah, I, I know. The memory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I wasn't there, and I forgot it too. Oh wait, never mind. That didn't make sense. <laughs> I, I, but, uh, I, I can relate to that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it's true. It's just, I, it just I, happens. I, have you listened to that one? Do you know that one? I don't know. That was. Uh, I mean, I was a kid at the time, but I didn't see that television mm -hmm. special. Oh. It was a Halloween special of Winnie the Pooh. Ah, mm. yes. Yes. That would be fun. Milne, A.A. Milne. Yes. Winnie the Pooh. Mm. Milne was a member of the Garrick Club in London. Hmm. And which club? The Garrick Club. The Garrick Club was created in memory of David Garrick, 
in about 1830s odd. Wow. Dickens was a member, Thackeray was oh, a member. My. In order that gentlemen might meet actors on equal terms. Hmm. Mm. Uh, so it is known as the Actors Club. There's a joke in there somewhere. It must be. Um, <laughs> and we have a number of distinguished writers. I mean, mm. Dickens, Thackeray, Milne mm. was one. And the Garrick Club was really falling into rather a bad state, like many London clubs did in the, in the, in the end of the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Mm. Uh, you know, they were beginning to in, go into decline. But Milne, uh, being the generous club member that he did, left the rights to Winnie the Pooh to the Garrick Club. Mm. Wow. And Disney Oops. bought them. <laughs> and... The Garrick Club never looked back. We now mm. have the greatest theatrical collection of pictures in the world. <laughs> I bet. I know we spent five million, I think, on a couple of uh, zophonies that actually David Garrick himself had. But mm. we've got portraits of every sort of, every actor of the, the 17th, 18th, 19th century virtually. Wow. Um, My goodness. And um, What a treasure. Yes. When the next time you guys treasure. are in London... Let's yeah. have dinner at the Garrick. I say we're there. Mm, you'd love it. Very impressive. Wow, no doubt good, about good, it. Good food and great wine. Why is our wine cellar great? Because every wine journalist in England is a member of, of oh. our wine club. <laughs> oh, I'm sure so, of that. So, so the club buys quantities of wine, you know, each year mm. and sells off the, the unwanted surplus five or ten years later, on average for half a million sure, pounds. Sure, I was thinking, uh, yeah, that's, <laughs> there's no money, I mean, that's, wow, it's a um, lot of pounds. A lot of pounds. But Olivier was a member, and Gilga was a member, <laughs> and uh, David Suchet is a member, mm. Fry is a member, and Roger, and Ed, was it Roger Fry? Uh, the, who wrote oh, The Ladies Not for Birmingham? Christopher Fry. Hmm. And it's, it's, a, it's a great place to have wow. lunch. Yeah, I, I would imagine. But we often raise a glass to uh, A.A. Milne and Winnie. Oh, oh that's nice. Hmm. That makes me happy. Good. Yeah, you've got to check that place yeah. out, Jim. I, I, will, I will be there the next time I go. I'll, I'll give you a buzz. Hmm. I'll say, John, I'm, I'm going to... I, I, we're <laughs> heading over there. I don't actually live... In London, um, hmm. I live on a place called the Isle of Man. Oh yes, uh, where the biker boys uh, come. Mm. We yes. all, we have the TT race, the Tourist Trophy race, which I think started in either 1904 or 1907. It is the greatest road race for bikes in the world. People, oh, that's wonderful! People whistle through these narrow stone cottage yes. streets, and and these. These hedgerows on either side. Yes. Go over the mountain and hope the sheep don't stray across the road. Yes. I, I've seen footage of this. It is. It's quite something. It, it is an extraordinary race. It is quite something. The yeah. top course speed was re, was broken this year, and I think we've got 136.6 miles an hour, which means, of course, they're doing over 220 in places in order to get round. That, that huge circuit. And that's on a bicycle? On a bike. A motorbike or a bicycle? Yeah, a motorbike. Oh, oh okay. okay. Oh, yeah, not... Uh, I, was, I was thinking, I somebody's was like, really whoa. pedaling. Somebody yeah. got real <laughs> Somebody's yeah. got some juice. <laughs> um, wow. It is a great place. Have you yeah. been to it? Well, I often go down to the end of the garden and see them coming down into Kirk Michael and... Vroom, 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 vroom. Yeah. And there's a <laughs> silence. And then you can hear... The helicopter coming. Yeah. <laughs> oh man! Ah oh, yes, we. Oh gosh. The mortality rate, I think, over since, <laughs> since the, the since the race started, I think we've lost hundred and seventy odd people. Oh, my oh gosh. wow! In the, yeah. It is. Whoa. A real, real tough road. Ooh. Okay. It's See, not, I'm not qualified to watch. <laughs> no. No. The lone ride. <laughs> no, 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 no. Now I'll be at the end going. Yep. Oh man, that's amazing. So do you do do you enjoy doing these Comic Cons? We're at a Comic Con. 
Yes, very do, much do, so. Do, do. In fact, I was just talking to Judge Judd Brophy, who's a fellow mm. actor from in Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, mm. and, a, and he's a New Zealander. And he said, I quite like coming to these, don't you? And I said, yes. And he said, why particularly? And I said, because I think that they're probably one of the most important part, part of an actor's education, to actually mm. get to meet the people who put the bread and butter on your mm. plate for, mm. for your career. I find, looking back, I don't really like Hmm. I think the younger the, you? The younger me, I think, didn't really like people. Hmm. Hmm. And I remember going to my first Comic Con, sort of 1997, 8 or 9, something like this, thinking, oh, God, why have I got to do this, for goodness sake, just to promote this damn show? All those people dressed up a like Captain Kirk and they get a life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, oh, and you're echoing Shatner's actual words. Yes, indeed. On Saturday Night Live, yeah. Um, get a life. Wow. But the truth is, they have a life. Yeah. And if you get to question and listen, you'll le realize what an extraordinary and real life it is, and a rich one. It's true. It's true. And, uh, you know, and they, they're having at the time of their lives. Yes, indeed. The time of their lives. So I, I love to see people laughing and happy and, yeah. and smiling. And um, I agree. It's a beautiful the, thing. The, the other great thing is that you get a chance to meet young people. A few years ago, I, I, I was a, a member of the advisory council of the Planetary Society, and oh. I, I got to use these events mm -hmm. as a way of finding a few bright youngsters to, to, to think about science. Mm. The Planetary Society was formed by a man called Carl Sagan. The great oh, I was going to ask you, where did that come from? And that explains it. Uh, Carl Sagan. And did he do it billions and billions of years ago? Yes. That's my bad Carl Sagan. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. I had to, get, had to get that out of my system. Please continue. Sagan, Sagan, <laughs> Sagan and the head of NASA and the head of JPL got together and said, look, if we're going to explore the solar system, you note the solar system, because he thought the distances were so great that we will never get outside the solar system. Mm. If we're going to do that, we're going to need chemists, biologists, physics, physicists, mathematicians, computer geeks, mm -hmm. architects, <laughs> engineers, mm. biotechnicians, medics, a, a whole range of, of, of people. Well, that's for sure. And so the society is basically created to sort of try and create a little... A, a little corpus of people who could build a nexus of connections and talents. Mm. And, of course, there are a lot of older people there, some of whom have won their fields or even their Nobels. Mm. And their function now is to try and bring on these young people. Mm. I was in New Zealand about 10, 12 years ago. It was a Sunday afternoon. The crowds were dying down. The school kids were there. Mm. And, you know, they were coming in to ask the questions. And... Uh, you know, the boys, as usual, dominating the conversation, the girls hanging back. So. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. <laughs> there were a couple of girls there, and I asked them to start talking about themselves. And then I turned to the second one and said, um, so what are you going to read at university? And she said, oh, probably law. And I said, well, what other qualifications do you have? What are you good at? And it turned out she, had, she was pretty good an all-rounder, really. And I said, well, in, instead of reading law, why don't you think about, why don't you think about science? You're clearly interested in, in space and science. Mm. And I gave them the speech about joining the, the Planetary Society, which, because if you're going to have a career in science, you need to learn to network quickly. And that's the start mm. where you start networking. Cut to, I'm walking in London, and this beautiful young woman comes up to me and says, Mr. Rhys Davis, you changed my life. I thought, oh, God, what have I done? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Here we go. And um, she said, I took your advice. I read maths and physics for my first degree, astronomy for my second degree, and I was a member of the Planetary Society. I, I got talking to... I think it was Bruce Betts then. Mm. And Bruce picked up the phone and he said, Fred, there's a young lady here that I think you should meet. And as a result of that, 
I'm about to go to Stanford to do my PhD in astrophysics. Oh, wow. 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 Another time, and I had this letter, this little email about 10 days ago. A young man sent uh, an email to me saying, Dear John, about 10 years ago, <laughs> you had a very big queue, and when I finally got up there, you spent 20 minutes talking to me oh. because, you dis because you discovered I was interested in astronomy, mm. and you told me to join the Astronomical Society in England. Mm -hmm. I just want you to know that I got my first degree in astronomy at Cambridge. Oh, I've done my. my masters. I'm halfway through my PhD in astronomy. Oh. And I wanted you to be the first to know oh. that I have just had my very first article accepted by the Royal Ast Astronomical Society. Oh my. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, that, now that's a feather. Now. That's, that's a feather in the cap. That's one of the things that we can do, mm -hmm. you know. And if you can just capture the imaginations of of of, of some star gazing, star dreaming sure. youngster, yeah, you know, yeah, literally and metaphorically. Yeah. That's, that's... But the damn thing is, anything I say to them, their parents have probably said to them, right? But because well, it sounds a lot better coming from you. <laughs> But because, because it's a parent, of course, nobody, oh. nobody listens to their parents. I've got an 18-year-old daughter who's going to read law. She's never seen Lord of the Rings. Mm. Oh, boy. She's never seen anything. So she's the one. Never seen anything. Raiders? No, Raiders nothing. Never seen any of those? Really? Nothing. Wow. Added to which she knows that I can't ride <laughs> because she's a rider, but I can't possibly ride. I said, go and look at that thing I did with Brooke Shields called Sahara. Yeah, I'm leading a cavalry charge there. No, <coughs> Daddy can't be allowed near a horse. He doesn't know the front end from the back. Oh end. boy! <laughs> but then, perfect. Parents and children. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Are you a big sci-fi fan? Yes. Yeah. Do you believe in aliens? Do I believe in aliens? Mm -hmm. They believe in you, by the way. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to throw you. Um, do I believe that the universe is big enough to have? Other, other forms of life, yes. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there are real constraints. I was reading New Scientist the other week. Oh. And a, a guy says in it, look, if you want to look for life on other planets, one of the things we've got to do is assess how much oxygen there is on the planet. Because if it's less than 18% mm -hmm. of the atmosphere, there can be no combustion. Hmm. There is no fire. There will be no technology that is based on heating things, fire-based things. Yeah, mm -hmm. but what if they can just like warp gravity? What if they have like some formula where they can just warp well, gravity? How do you and they get the technology need... without starting from stone chippings to turning, discovering that metal will is available and will melt and we. Will, uh, and can be used. I'm not sure. You can't. What if they're not even carbon-based life forms? Yeah, I was thinking, what about those little guys down at the bottom of the ocean? Ah, uh, well, you know. Whew. I mean, that's pretty much the closest thing we have, yeah. visual evidence of aliens, right? Those things are crazy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, mm. they, they, a lot of them look like they're not from here. Like well, those little fish with the yeah, glowing... I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I've been to one or two small communities that are rather inbred, and I... And they do that. That's true. Yeah, that's oh, funny, where's yeah. that? Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm down there in Arkansas. <laughs> my, everybody's real friendly down there. Uh, <laughs> the problem is distance. Mm. Yeah, sure enough, there must be there must be life yeah. in the universe because it is it is pretty pretty vast. Yes. But if you're looking at us ever finding it... Yeah, that's a good... Yeah. I mean, we... Homo sapiens sapiens has been around between, what, 200, 200 year million... 200,000, yeah. 100,000 years, perhaps. Something 40, like that. 40, 50 generations, perhaps. Mm -hmm. 50, what am I talking? 50,000 generations. Somebody calculated the other day that the number of people on the Earth in total had been about 108 billion Total human beings ever. I think so. Oh, God, I think I've got that figure wrong. One and eight. 
Well, I'm sure yeah, somebody, what? somebody leave in the yeah, comments. Folks. Somebody yeah. leave in the comments. Inclu how many people? Yes. Um, yeah, someone will correct us. When we're <laughs> oh yes. Some wise and but, but um, history really begins about fourteen thousand, ten thousand years ago in terms of, you know, people being able to come together and create mm -hmm. communities. You know, our ancestors were at the end of an ice age, mm -hmm. uh, and that was just about survival. Yeah, it certainly was. So we could have. Glad they did it, though. Yeah, me too. But I mean, <laughs> our species is relatively young. Right. And look where we are. I mean, without over-dramatizing, you know, there is a real possibility that our species could come to an end within a, a hundred years or certainly a thousand years. Mm. I mean, the artificial intelligence oh, yeah. thing alone. Yeah. yeah, you're familiar with, I think he's a Norwegian philosopher called Nick Bostrom. And, and Bostrom uh, has a theory called the paperclip uh, mm. experiment. It's a thought experiment. Uh, if, you, if you give a machine with artificial intelligence the instruction, maximize the production of paperclips, it would start to list what it needs, it would start to, uh, to, start to assemble it, and it would also be in a millionth of a second thinking, now, what could limit my production of paper clips? Well, being switched off would limit my production of clips. <laughs> what could turn me off? Ah, humans. Eliminate humans because I must maximize the production of paper clips. Mm. We cannot imagine the way a, th a machine thinks. Yeah. Mm. And that will be our, could be our, our downfall. Downfall. One of the creepiest stories I've heard of AI was they did this experiment and it was like a, you know where a chat bot is? Like a, yes. A chat bot. It's mm -hmm. like a, a program where these, you know, you can type in prompts and the, the machine or the computer will type back to you simulating like a oh. human conversation. Oh, 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 yes, yes, yes. And they did this thing on Twitter where they had these two chat bots and they were talking to each other and they started talking to each other and then they kind of figured out that they were both like programs. And so they didn't even keep talking in English. They just started making their own language and it was just like a bunch of periods and exclamation marks and commas. Oh, wow. And then it wasn't entertaining for anybody on Twitter anymore. But it kind yeah. of creeps me out that they kind of just like realized they this. They just did that. And wow. then they started doing essentially like a Morse code variant of conversation to each other. Oof. And it's like, are they really understanding each well, other? I'd are like they really what the hell actually communicating? About. Right. All right. Break it up, you two. You know, it's kind of like, <laughs> that's enough. Hey, hey, hey. Oof. Yeah. Wow, that's kind of scary. Yeah, but once and you go, the eyes turn towards you. Yeah, yeah. And Oof. and 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 the the long finger extends. <laughs> yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. I'll sleep well tonight. That's that's insane. Yeah. But that to come back insane. to your question, uh, is there are there aliens and are they here? Mm -hmm. I tend to be a skeptic. Yeah. Now, have you ever seen anything? in the sky that would have indicated to you that maybe something's out there. Yes. Okay. Can yes. you expand on that? The first time I was... The first time? I was a schoolboy in Cornwall, mm. and there was something up in the sky that did not appear to be like either a weather balloon or a plane or anything mm -hmm. like that. Now, this would be pre-satellite. Mm. Mm. Oh, okay. And its movements were, it was stationary and then irregular. And sort of I, like, like, meep, meep, yes, meep, but, so, or, or certainly, but would it hover? And then, vroomf. Okay. It was an unnatural movement. And even in those days, I mm. knew a little bit about, you know, acceleration and gravity. Sure. The second time was out in Africa. And I saw something at night, and it was light. Uh, and again, it was seemed to be skimming low-ish. Mm. But how can you really measure distance? Well, how did it? How did it appear? I mean, was it a uh, sphere? Was it? Well, it, it? It just seemed to be a bit sphere-like. But mm. I also suffer from bad eyesight. Well. So, uh, <laughs> so it could have been I'm a not, plane. I'm not claiming it. Look, you cannot dismiss 
the comments of you know established fighter pilots and oh uh, and, and absolutely and, uh, and people like that you can't you cannot dismiss uh, those things mm -hmm. uh, all well, I, they they don't they're they're all in they're oh, yeah, you absolutely. know all absolutely. the fighter pilots absolutely are, yeah. oh absolutely absolutely you know but you know you you look at the other side and you think come on I, and I, I, I'm not the other side being the, the skeptic. Well, the, the other side being is look at the distances between between galaxies. Yeah, um, and that assumes that we know how to travel to them. I mean, because if they're doing it our way, it's going to take a while. If they've got something better. Who knows? You still can't exceed but Robert the speed Einlein of, and all the, the still folding can't space exceed, and see the speed of light. That's yeah. an interesting theory of the, the folding of space. I've heard that one before, yeah. where, like, yeah. theoretically, you know, like, mm -hmm. if there was a way to travel, if, like, the... I don't even know how to expand on it. Right, yeah, but it's... yeah. yeah it in was, other words, you fold space, or space folds, and so instead of going from there to there, what you're going is going from there to there. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, I don't have the maths or the brain to be able to... To, to really understand Einstein and Nor do I. space no. time and time dilation, isn't it? What is it? Um, it's, um, oh, I beg your pardon, I'm getting old and senile. Oh, that's all right. I am too. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm way ahead of you. Yes, yes. <laughs> but the distances are, are so great. Mm -hmm. And there are so many things against it. I mean, you know, by and large, the time it takes a species to reach a, sure. a a technological age that can be relatively short, but a species may not live long enough to actually go further. Mm. And two species on two different worlds may be on a totally different time scale. Indeed, mm -hmm. there may be intelligent life on, in, on Alpha Centauri on one of the one of the planets mm -hmm. going around one of the stars there. Mm -hmm. Its civilization may have come and gone, or right, its civilization right, right. may yet to be. You know, and, and, and the idea that they can just overlap would demand an awful lot more coincidences. Mind you, our whole universe is yeah. packed with coincidences. Well, who was it that said the universe is not just queerer than we do imagine? I think it was Isaac Newton. It's queerer than we can imagine. Yes. Mm. I got to believe that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Well, you know, I saw, I, I will say this. When I was a kid, I was a dickhead on a riverboat in, out of New Orleans. And we we're out there, and this is, I don't know, early 70s. I was reading, oddly enough, Time for the Stars by Robert Einlein. Mm -hmm. And I was down in the galley. I was a dickhead. I was 19. And uh, there were different, you know, rings. Ding, ding, ding. Meant go tighten up the toe. Ding, 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 ding. Ding, ding, meant go do something else. And I was just sitting there and went, ding, 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 ding. And, and I, I assumed that meant get your ass up Here's to the, to the uh, wheelhouse. So I did. I ran up and it goes. And, and we're in, I'll tell you where we were, western uh, Louisiana or eastern Texas. I don't know. But, you know, because there's an international waterway. There's, you don't see it from the map, but there's yeah. a million waterways between yes, yes. Louisiana and Texas. And uh, we were in there. And he goes, look, at, look over there. And it was going red, bluish, red, bluish. He goes, that just moved. And, and, and I said, no, it didn't. You moved. We're on a boat. <laughs> come on, come on, come on, Rob, or whatever your name was. And, uh, and, and I said, you looked at it a minute ago. Then you looked at it over there. Looked at it again, and it looked like it, and it went like this. I said, okay, that just moved. And it moved while I was telling him it couldn't possibly move. And it was a red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, red, blue. And I said, and we just kind of stood there, like, oof. And at the time, there were tons of UFO sightings on yes. the news. And uh, on these boats, they are gigantic, gigantic uh, spotlights. And I said, oh, okay. Well, I, you know, and I turned it on. And, and you have to do two cranks at one time. One goes up, one goes down. And I try, tried to crank it up on. To the, it was seeable. I mean, if it was during the daytime, we could have went and pointed at it. And I, I tried to get the light up on it, and it went, 
And that was it. It was there. It was. It moved. And I went, oh, shine a light. Goodbye. So that was my big UFO sighting. I feel like everybody has one. I feel yeah. like everybody has one at least. You know, it's it's bizarre. It's and I think it's the curiosity of the mind, the human mind too. Oh yeah. You know, just, well, I, it had my <laughs> curiosity. Yeah. I was tweaked. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I'll never forget it. Mm -hmm. I've told that story a million times. It, it's still a little goose bumpy. It's kind of yeah. cool. You know, I like the idea that somebody could be out there and please be nice guys, you know, please, <laughs> you know, cause if they, I mean, we're, we're, we don't have technology to go visit them. So I figure their technology to come visit us means they could probably win in a street fight. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't think that, uh, I, I don't think there's any dispute about that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you're right. Absence of proof is not proof of absence. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, I was just yeah. going to say that. No, I wasn't. <laughs> but that sounded better when you said it. Yeah. Everything sounds better when he says it. <laughs> absence of proof is not proof of absence. And, and, and uh, you know, you may, uh, how we all would love to think that there was a community out there waiting for us to grow up and join them. Yes, that's, that's kind of the way I've always thought about yeah. it. Yeah. But they're patting us on the head. Yeah. I, but Try I Try not to kill each other too much. You know, that's kind of. Yeah. But I can't see the numbers really matching. You know, mm. the, the probabilities, I, I'm not a mathematician, but mm. the probabilities are pretty remote. So the question is, what is it? Mm. What did you see? What, what are the things we see? Mm -hmm. The other disquieting thing. It wasn't a weather balloon, by the way. No. That was, <laughs> that's the old, it was probably a weather balloon. Yeah, that's, you the, know, that's the old saw. It's, it's, it's like the archaeologist, <laughs> the archaeologist thing. Um, whenever you see a votive offering mm -hmm. in archaeology, it, it's code for we haven't a clue what it means. Or we oh. haven't a clue what it is. Uh, and it, it's an in-joke, really. Um, it's a votive offering. Something tells me you, would, you, would, you have a stronger handle on that than the average bear. So. Well, <laughs> well, you know, it's pretty impressive when you can talk to archaeologists and say, well, of course, you know, mm -hmm. I was there when we discovered the Ark of the Covenant and, mm -hmm. and the Holy Grail, but I'm mean, sure your work is significant. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. It's right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, that's funny. Well, yeah. speaking of your work, I kind of well, want to jump done topics an amazing, here. Yeah. Amazing career. I mean, you know, you've, you've been in the, some of the most iconic... Well, movies of all time, but the lineage, it's Indiana Jones and the I mean, you're done talking. That's it. I mean, Steven Spielberg and, and then on to, on to the Lord of the Rings. I mean, my gosh, it's, it's you know, insane. I, I've been very lucky. Yeah. And luck, of course, is, is the most important characteristic of an actor's. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I'll buy that. Yeah. It's assumed that you know how to do the job if you can get the job. Mm. But getting the job, how the heck? I, I've known so many good actors who, you know, the jobs just dried up or they never really happened. Mm. And Yeah, you're right about that. When you're a younger actor, you know, you can always get away with, of course, you know, I, was, I was a better actor. But as it goes on, you know, you just realize more and more it's luck. Mm. Mm -hmm. And uh, would you agree with the expression that luck is being prepared for the moment? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a very, very nice. I hadn't heard that one. That's a good one. I must, I must try and steal that one from you. Well, you know, your co-star, Harrison Ford, I remember, got to be 20, maybe 30 years ago, he was being interviewed, probably Entertainment Tonight, somebody like that. And they said, well, well here you are, you're in Star Wars. I mean, does it get bigger? And, and then next thing you know, Indiana Jones, Raiders of, you know, it's kind of like, how can you be this lucky to be, not, not lucky, but how, how, were you ever in your wildest imagination when you were doing American Graffiti, thinking that I'll probably be in two of the biggest movie franchises in this particular universe, you know, and he goes, luck. And I, and I thought, wow, okay. Because he's perfect for everything he's in, and that's not luck. 
but he, he, he just said, you know, and, uh, and then he started telling the story about um, Sam, uh, Sam Elliott that uh, had auditioned right before him for Indiana Jones or, or after him, something like that. And he goes, oh, well, I'm not going to get it. And then he, it's like, who's Sam Elliott? You know, <laughs> he's doing fine. But uh, he's no indie. No, oh, I know. And, and when you said, indie, indie, I have done terrible impressions of you for a long time. You know, <laughs> when, when, you know, and I met Harrison Ford like one time and I'm Indy. And I was so glad he didn't hear me because it would have been really embarrassing. Yeah, it gets a bit embarrassing. Then, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, you're doing a perfect impression of you. I do. And we're all glad that you do. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I think I think I'm just about done the last one, though. Have I really? Uh, <laughs> you know, the. Um, oh, I think there's a lot of gas in that tank. Oh, trust me. Yeah. <laughs> Trust me, yes. Oh, I do. I saw him flirting with my wife. Uh, I think we already talked about that. God, so. he's going to bitch about he's that. Gonna <laughs> bitch. He's going to bitch. He's still got plenty of gas. Yeah. Oh, that's um, funny. That's a beautiful thing. So um, I, right at the moment, I'm trying to get the time and a bit of money to finish off the little sound stage I've been building in the Isle of Man. And when I've done that, I'm going to go out and try and shake the money tree. Because mm. I want the money to make the movies that I want to make mm. before I shuffle off this small coil, coil. etc. So that's good. Uh, well, we all want that too. Uh, we don't. We just yes. yes. But um, no, I want it for you. Oh, that's right. <laughs> well, open your wallet and say after oh, me, help okay. yourself. Oh, I'll get right back to you. <laughs> oh, okay, never mind. Okay, good night, everybody. <laughs> we're, we're <laughs> right. Um, but I'm curious, if you don't mind me asking you a question, I'm just really curious about the, the casting process for The Lord of the Rings. You know, you played such an iconic character in Gimli. And mm. when I first met you, I didn't realize that you were such a thespian. And that kind of took me back because, you know, Lord of the Rings is so fantastical and, you know, it's the only movie that's ever, only fantasy movie that's ever won an Oscar in that category. You know, there's been no other fantasy movie that's won mm. Best Picture. And so I'm just curious, like, what your approach was to that role and the casting process kind of getting mentally prepared for that role. Was it any different than anything else or is it just kind of... Here's the next one. I got asked if I wanted to be in Lord of the Rings, and I said, no, yeah, sure. They're going to make a movie of it? <laughs> Not a chance. Mm. It's unfilmable. Mm. Mm. Nobody can read the damn book as far as I'm concerned, let alone <laughs> make a movie out of it. It was a chore. Yeah. And I said, well, they're going to shoot in New Zealand. I thought, oh, gosh, I haven't been in New Zealand yet. No, that's not bad. <laughs> what I want is... You know, about a month's work and perhaps, you know, six or eight weeks on, on top of that so I can have a look around New Zealand, you know, and tick it off because then I'll have done New Zealand and, you know, but the, it's going to be a big movie. And I thought, wait a minute, this is nonsense. Mm. They tried it before and it can't be done. It's not filmic. Mm. It, that's why Tolkien sold it so cheaply. Because he had a tax bill, about mm. it. And, uh, oh no! Wow. Yeah, and he thought just get any money, and somebody wanted to buy the film rights of it, uh, and uh, <sighs> and he sold it for well. Uh, one story I, I heard was it was about a hundred pounds, but I'm told actually it was a bit more than that. It was about sixteen hundred, eighteen hundred pounds. Wow! Um, <sighs> and it proved a rather good purchase for somebody. And then they said, okay, and I said, they sent me a bit of paper, and, and the, the, the audition I had to do was uh, for the part that John Noble, my friend John Noble, ended up playing. Mm. I thought, this is great, you know, it's about... What, which what character was that? Um, well, I can't remember the name of him, but he's the, he's the mad king at the end who, who, who ends up killing his own son. Um, oh, jeez. I thought, yeah. Is this a Hamlet deal or something? No way. <laughs> uh, I sent I sent the audition in, and, you know, forgot about it, and about two months, three months later, they said, "John, well done, you've got it." And I thought, "Got got what? Got what? Yeah. They want you to play Gimli the dwarf." And I said, "Are you out of your tiny?" <laughs> and they, yeah, great. Uh, and I said, "Do you realize how much time I would spend in makeup were I to do this thing?" 
Oh, no, my, my manager said, trust me, John, they'll get it down to about an hour. I said, no, no, down I'm not going to gonna do hour. this for God's sake. I spent 30 years trying to be recognized. Now you want me to go to New Zealand nominally for three years in a film that will fail at the box office for the first Ooh. part. <laughs> And it will be it, it will be direct to video if they can scrape enough together oh, for boy. the second part. This is doomed to fader. This chap, Peter Jackson, yes, I've seen his work. Oh, He's yeah. very good. He's a very good small filmmaker, mm. but he doesn't know what he's letting him in self in for. This is a film with 21 leading parts. You know, it, it demands shooting in different locations. It's unfilmable anyway. This is a, com this is, this has got the hallmarks of failure stamped on it. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't want to do it. And my manager, uh, the, my new agency, APA, said, John, if, if you don't do this part, I don't think we can continue to represent you. Wow. And... Mm. Um, and my son, my elder son, said, Dad, with respect, if you turn down this, uh, you'll be making a huge mistake. And I said, why? He said, you think about it. In every bookshop in the world, there's that much book space devoted to Tolkien. Mm. Think of what that means as a fan base. Mm, and I smart thought, guy. Yeah. Nice. I thought, yeah. Well done. He may have a point there. But it's not going to happen. <laughs> okay, Still. Okay, okay, okay. I'll go to New Zealand. <laughs> I'll go to New Zealand and we'll go through the process. All right. Well, and, and, and we'll, I'll just check out what, they're, what they've set sure. up. Well, there's there. a nice pub there. Okay, a nice pub. <laughs> but let's see whether these, come on. You can't make a film like that in New Zealand. It has, it has no... You know, the resources that you need yeah, are yeah. major studio stuff. You'd only find that in Rome or Paris, possibly, L.A., London. But New Zealand? Mm. There's never been a yeah, big film made in New Zealand. A major hub of industry. Mm -hmm. And I went there and I spent every morning and every afternoon for two weeks going into every department and looking at what they were doing. I was in the office when the phone went and uh, the set designer said, hang on just a minute, John. He said, oh, really? Oh, thank you. That was, um, that was our printer, the, the guys who print up our, our architectural plans. Mm. We've just got to eight kilometers of plans so far. <gasps> what? Lay the plans ed, ed to end. They had eight kilometers of plans printed. <gasps> plans? Holy cow. Sets, plans. Okay. Wow. Right. So you begin to think. <laughs> um, wow, yeah, that's what you think. Yeah, and wow. then I, I, my, I got progressively depressed as every department, <laughs> every department had a level of expertise <laughs> in it yeah. that you would only expect to find in the big, you know, great studios. Mm. Mm. Uh, but it had something else, too. There was a level of sheer, uh, sheer enthusiasm and passion oh, for the that's work. that's wonderful. You know, the guy who was showing me how he'd actually turned uh, 1,800, 18, was it 1,800 meters of iron pipe cutting it to make the links for the chain mail. Wow. Um, wow. You know. Uh, wow. Um, and, and at the end of it, I thought, good God, they have an infrastructure here to do it. How the heck am I going to get out of this, I thought. <laughs> get to get out of it. Uh, and, or get into it further. And, and then, because the film is unfilmable, it can't do it. <laughs> and then I, I thought, I've got one get out. Let's see how this... A little man who runs around in shorts um, <laughs> handles his cast and handles his crew. Mm. And I spent two days watching him. And I thought, oh, dear me. He may just pull this cut off. To, cut to three weeks later, we have a, a, a press conference. 
and I'm listening to the questions and the cynicism, and I, I get up and say, ladies and gentlemen of the press, revise your expectations upwards. Mm. Three predictions. They're making Star Wars in Australia at the moment. The first film will gross more money than the new Star Wars. Peter Jackson goes like that and buries his head in his hands. <laughs> <laughs> Second, these films are going to be amongst the greatest of this decade. And in 20 years' time, when you look back, you will recognize them as being all-time classics. Newspaper reports, actor says, Lord of the Rings will outgross Star Wars. Um, 18 months later, Perfect. PJ came to me and he said, you know when you said that at the press conference? I said, you mean that moment when you buried your head in your hands? <laughs> yes. He said, we, we just had the, 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 the box office taking yeah, it. Oh, moment, here we go. And we've just exceeded Star Wars. Um... I just didn't take into account the sheer genius yeah. of Jackson and mm. the genius of the writers. Mm -hmm. And I underestimated the talent in New Zealand. Mm. And, and, and I, I, I live to celebrate it yes. all the time now. Yes, because, yes. I mean, we talk about who are the greats mm -hmm. you know, of our time. Mm-hmm. I think if we were still in the era of silent films, the greatest filmmaker of all would be Steve, Steven Spielberg. Nobody, mm. nobody can tell a story through a lens better than Steven. Mm. Mm -hmm. He is one of the giants of film of all time. Oh, yeah, that's for sure. But, you know, if you take into account the creation of a studio the creation of an entire film industry, really. They had a film industry, but, you know, it was mm -hmm. a little film industry. The creation of a major film industry in a country. Mm -hmm. Then Peter Jackson really has to be amongst one of the greats of all time. Oh, my time. goodness. For uh, sure. he, without question. We had a, we yeah. had a Labour prime, uh, prime Minister uh, in, in New Zealand at the time... And she decided unilaterally to get hood of, rid of knighthoods. Uh, and she was going to create really? a New Zealand order of merit. Mm. And uh, I was the one who kept going to say, and who is this who has unilaterally got rid of knighthoods? When Peter Jackson, order of the splatted possum grade one, goes into a studio, the studio won't be particularly impressed by the title. But when Sir Peter Jackson goes in, and you should give him one, why? Because he has done more to put New Zealand on the map of the world than any man since Captain Cook. <laughs> um, That's for certain. Yeah, and, and actually then, uh, 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 of course, when we were all invited to the Beehive, I was the one person who never got asked to shake her hand. <laughs> <laughs> and if you look at the New Zealand postage stamps of Lord of the Rings, there's no Gimli there. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> really? But it was right. You know, yeah. she had no idea. When we, when we went to New Zealand, tourism in New Zealand was worth about $1.3 billion a year. The last figure I saw, and they juggled around how you calculate it, and that was before COVID, uh, it was either 14 point something billion or 17 point something billion. Wow. That's the impact that Peter Jackson had on his country. Yeah. You know, uh, when you, you just take that alone into account, you realize that's, there are giants. That's all you us. need. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There are giants among us. Yeah. Uh, that's amazing. Well, you're one of them. Yeah. Oh, oh, we dwarves you. are. Yeah, we, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Find the inner dwarf, folks. <laughs> uh, now, my assistant is there in the corner, 
twitching. <laughs> Which, uh, that's, uh, <laughs> She's trying to indicate to me that if we don't get any dinner, <laughs> yeah, she <laughs> won't help me pack she, and I'm on a plane. Off is not a place you want to be. No, no, yeah. no, no. Okay. So are there any other questions? Uh, uh, well, no, but thank you for coming. All right. Thank you for being here, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. Come oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Davis. Thank you very much. Well, stay sweet as honey. Jolly nice to see you. Oh, my goodness. God bless. Okay. Say hi to the thank missus. You. I will do it. Very good. All right. Young thank man, you. thank you for looking after Thank me. you. Thank you. That was Very a lot of fun. Okay. All right. A younger and man. I'll close yes. this out oh, here. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, everybody, for watching. That was another episode of Tuned In with Jim Cummings. Don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us on YouTube. You can find us bonus content on Patreon and, of course, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all that good stuff. Until the next episode, this is Tuned In with Jim Cummings and John Rhys-Davies. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. <laughs>